So I'll leave it to my panelists now to introduce themselves, and we'll start with Oliver. Thank you, James. And uh, thank you, Chair Gensler and uh, Jay, for an incredible warm-up act. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was actually really refreshing to hear um, how, uh, you know, techno uh, how technologically informed that conversation was. But, um, I'm Oliver Volansberg Sadi. I'm the founder and CEO of BCB Group. Uh, we are a neobank for the crypto industry. Uh, we are here to be that connective tissue between uh, the fiat world and the crypto world where uh, payments are the, uh, the, the super tricky regulatory uh, space to play in. So uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, James. Thank you. Ophelia? Um, I'm Ophelia. I'm one of the co-founders and the president of 21 Shares. We uh, offer a range of crypto exchange traded products in the European market. Um, brought our first product to market about three years ago, all based on spot, so a little bit different than what we're currently seeing in the US. Thank you. And Chris? Thanks, James. Uh, great to be here, everyone. My name is Christopher Matta. I am the president of 3IQ Digital Assets US. Uh, 3IQ is an asset manager based out of uh, Canada, the, the parent company, um, which launched the first cryptocurrency exchange traded products in North America on the Toronto Stock Exchange back in 2020. Thank you very much, Chris. Well, we'll, um, we'll go into our first question. And so I think we have to uh, face the elephant in the room and talk about what we've just heard. Um, when Gary was appointed, I think there was a, a, a high degree of confidence and optimism, wasn't there? When, uh, given his background, obviously he was a, a lecturer doing a blockchain course as well. He definitely demonstrated a deep understanding of the space. There was no question about that. So I, f I felt pretty encouraged. But um, th on this optimism, um, Ophelia, has he sort of d delivered? Um, did you hear anything today that you found interesting? Um, so I think there's a two-part answer to that. One is has he delivered? And I think the question is, what were we expecting him to deliver? Um, my opinion is, and sort of has been, I think regulators globally are smart about crypto at this stage. And I think that was incredibly obvious in this conversation, right? Fundamentally, I think the hopes in terms of, you know, having a staff that understood the issues, I think we've gotten that. Um, I think the most interesting takeaway for me from that conversation was, the focus on centralization as the road to regulation as opposed to finding ways to adapt regulations to a decentralized reality that these assets live in, which is quite a complicated question if we're waiting for a single dominant player to emerge, either in terms of exchanges, regulators, things like that. I, I in some respects, feels like it runs almost directly in opposition to some of the goals that Bitcoin set out to address now, you know, more than 10 years ago. Um, and I think for me, that was one of the most interesting parts of that discussion. I yeah, you certainly went uh, uh, a long way to say that these are, you know, some of the platforms are providing layered services and, you know, if it uh, acts like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it should be regulated like a duck, right? Chris, do you have any thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, um, you know, the, the mention of AML and KYC in the traditional sense where we have, uh, and, and this was mentioned by uh, former SC, uh, CFTC chairman uh, Christian Carlo in, in a small uh, talk yesterday, you know, the KYC and AML structure of the past was because of the account-based system through the banks, which was touched on, you know, you kind of have these gatekeepers, which runs directly uh, against what the decentralized finance space is trying to do. So rather than you know, forcing the KYC AML structure of today and impose that on the crypto space, why not come up with a new AML regime that can still, you know, work to prevent illicit activity, but not necessarily require uh, identity upfront as part of the process because that's part of the, you know, your Fourth Amendment privacy rights in financial inclusion. And so he, uh, Christian Carlo gave a really great example of kind of getting on a highway and you don't get asked for your information before you can get on the highway. If you do something wrong, you get pulled over, they get your information and, and you know, you get written up. In the blockchain space, that is something that's possible now that you have, you know, pseudonymous transactions, you can see them on the blockchain, you can track illicit activity and after the fact impose AML type of restrictions on those illicit activities where appropriate. So I think that's just an example of what Ophelia is describing. 
around like rethinking the way that the, the regulatory infrastructure is built and trying to just impose that on a decentralized system can be really challenging when it kind of runs completely in contrast to what the, the technology is doing. And I think part of that is there are actually things you can do with the blockchain that from an AML perspective that go way beyond what we've been conditioned to think is acceptable in the current traditional environment. I mean, for example, I don't know if everyone in this room has tried this, but I would encourage you to try it if you haven't. You can actually track the entire progression of a specific unit of Bitcoin from inception all the way through to today. From the day it was mined, you can know every single wallet it's been through, every transaction it's been involved in. Yeah. That's far more sophisticated monitoring than we could ever possibly hope to have on a fiat currency. I mean, it's not a great ransom currency, really, is it? <laughs> uh, that was, the, I guess, one of the things that uh, Gary said that I was a little bit disappointed to hear. You know, the uh, reference again to use it, using Bitcoin for payment in ransomware, when in, in sort of relative terms, it's de minimis versus traditional uh, uh, bearer instruments like currency notes, right? Um, uh, Oliver, do you have any uh, final points on this question? For sure. I think um, <clears throat> both Chris and Ophelia, you know, mentioned the, the challenges here, summed them up quite neatly. Uh, the, the point is, where the innovation is happening in the space of decentralized finance. If something goes wrong, you can't speak to the manager. There is no uh, central point. Now, of course, some of them start centrally, but for regulation to be effective in a decentralized future, we need to shift um, from thinking about the people and processes model in which tech is merely an enabler to thinking about everything as tech. And this is where actually uh, decentralized um, finance and the, the blockchains that underlie it, like Solana, which is uh, it's the it's the transfer of value layer plus the programmability plus a built-in order book at the blockchain level, is that you can go to GitHub and download the code and and understand it. Regulators need to hire engineers and look at it um, f and and make the you know. The, the best of, of, of that huge advantage, which it is transparent. Not only can you see where a unit of value has traveled throughout its lifetime, but you can see how that unit of, unit of value is traded and governed. Um, and that spans all three of the, um, the pillars, which Gary mentioned, the, uh, you know, the, the, the formation of capital, the, the markets, and the investors. Yeah, no, thank you. And um, I think he said repeatedly, um, engage the SEC. And um, I'm, ho I'm hopeful all three of your firms will be engaging because it's obviously a source of real expertise. Um, staying with you, Oliver, with the next question, a little bit closer to uh, our own homes in the UK, just a quick one. Um, the Bank of England and the uh, FCA have taken a somewhat harsh view on, uh, on, on, on crypto assets. And that's actually caused some companies to leave the UK for a better, better regulatory regime. What are your views on this? And sort of how do you set up BCB Group, which is obviously a European-based, UK-based company? Um, how, do you, how do you act to that? I think people who see the UK and, the, and, and Europe, that the regulations are still super closely aligned as a hostile environment for crypto. Um, are missing out on, on, on something important. Both the FCA and, and the European regulators are, you know, it's an arms race that we've got here. The, the pace of innovation in the crypto space is simply too, uh, too quick. Um, it's, a, it's a capacity problem. The FCA want to, I mean, the FCA have now got a taxonomy, which is great. Uh, the EU wants to bring in Mika, which is great, in, in, you know, in two, three years. Um, but it's a capacity issue. And again, back to my point, the regulators need to hire way more engineers to, 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 um, to keep up. Introducing these regs, of course, raises the barrier to entry. So um, it makes it harder for small businesses to get going. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, you know, the situation is improving. And um, actually, today I learned that the SEC has probably one of the most uh, sophisticated views. Um, and uh, you know, our us on the other side of the Atlantic have a few things to, to learn. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think, um, I feel like your, your companies are also exposed to the European uh, um, uh, geography. Uh, any, anything to add on that? Yeah, so we, we deal with quite a few different European regulators in the context of our business, whether those are you know, our local regulators in Switzerland or you know, other EU bodies, Bothan coming to mind. Um, I actually completely disagree. I think they are quite knowledgeable about what they're doing. I think the epic of 
the like the storyline of regulators not understanding crypto and therefore doing X, Y, or Z has sort of ended. Right. Um, and I, I do think that narrative was absolutely true a few years ago, where they were working really hard to get smart. Switzerland being one of the first people, to first countries really to come out with a comprehensive framework. Um, but I think that's changed. A lot of the conversations that I'm having now are very nuanced, very detailed, statistically driven, data driven arguments. We've moved away from conversations about like what is a blockchain, how does Bitcoin work, what does any of this mean, into like really nuanced discussions. And I think while it's, it's obviously clear from the conversations we heard this morning, the SEC is very sophisticated on these topics. I think European regulators are equally, and in some places, have just taken a slightly different view on how they want to approach um, these assets. If you think about you know terms like crypto and, and blockchain and, and Bitcoin making it into um, German legislation for the first time, that's a fairly large indicator that they're, you know, in a very similar place to where the U.S. is, where we can think about, you know, crypto having been a major point of discussion in a tax bill is a pretty unique thing to have seen this year. I'm detecting a, a bit of cautious optimism there, Philia. That's great to, great to hear. I think, Chris, um, moving on, on to you, obviously, you have a different regulatory regime again, um, one that's thoroughly embraced your product. Um, could you just compare and contrast some of the, some of the answers you had just heard, and why do you think there's such a wide range of, um, of, 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 of positions? Yeah, I think when you take into account new technologies like cryptocurrencies and decentralized tech and Web3, um, you know, these are... Uh, cutting edge, the regulatory environment across the world for even the internet and web two is still being evolved and developed, right? You have Zuckerberg continuing to testify in front of Congress and on a variety of privacy issues. So this is not a process that's gonna be over in the next few years. This is a, a very long-term process that's, that's going to continue as part of the web three movement. Um, and uh, the, the regulatory regimes in each country vary drastically and, and each regulator is trying to fit this space into that framework. So you're gonna continue to see, I think, divergence if you touch on certain things, right? I mean, the technology is an underlier, but if we talk about ETFs, yeah. I think I think that's maybe worth spending a few minutes on. I'm coming on to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, 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 we'll end there, and then we can circle up on the ETFs when. It moves. Yeah. I mean, that was. Uh, I, I saw a couple of ETF providers. And I was two two on the on the stage, and a couple uh, in the audience taking some uh, live video at the point when they were talking about ETFs. So it, it's um, it's front and central for lots of people in this room. Um, the ETF, ETF debate, obviously, here in the U.S., polarizes people. The SEC denied VanEx um, uh, spot-based ETF, but obviously has allowed futures-based ETF. Now, uh, people that understand the, upper, uh, the apparatus that sort of are involved with the spot markets through to futures market, through to you know, marketplaces like that, <laughs> it's, it's somewhat questionable, actually, isn't it? So, so Chris, let's, let's just unpack this. And why was one allowed and not the other first? Um, and what has it meant for actual consumers of this? Of this uh, yeah, so I think to start kind of with the, the second piece, why, why is this important? Why, why do uh, investors care about a futures-based ETF versus a physical-based ETF, right? So at a high level, um, futures-based ETFs, like for Bitcoin, the f Bitcoin futures, the CME Bitcoin futures trade at a premium to the underlying spot market. It's called contango with, with futures. Essentially what that means in simple terms is on a uh, annualized basis, the ETF itself has to roll contracts every month. They buy the front month contract, the next month they have to roll that to the next month's contract. And because those contracts trade at a premium, essentially what you get over the course of a year is underperformance of an ETF-based vehicle backed by futures relative to the price and performance of the underlier physical Bitcoin itself. So over the course of a year, that underperformance could be in the range of five to 15%, potentially even higher at times, depending on how large those premiums are. So for long-term investors, a futures-based ETF is not really the best um, uh, vehicle because you're going to have that erosion of the performance. And that's why the space has been advocating for a physically backed ETF for a long time. So that's why it's important. In terms of why a futures-based ETF has been approved and a physical ETF has not been approved, this has really culminated just recently, obviously, with a lot of the comments from Chair Gensler and the approval of, Van e um, of, of some of the futures-based, you know, ProShares and VanEck futures-based ETFs. 
a lot of those comments were around, you know, there's additional investor protections around, you know, a 40 Act vehicle that is, uh, that it has an underlier of futures that are directly regulated and overseen by the CFTC. Yeah. So I think that's given some comfort to the SEC. But conversely, you know, I think it's been confusing for a lot of folks in the space because the price discovery process where the market manipulation concerns that the SEC has continued to highlight for the underlier, um, the, the, the price discovery process uh, is influenced on the futures, obviously, by the spot markets, which is where the SEC has cited many times that there's market manipulation concerns and a lack of regulatory oversight of those exchanges. So it, it can be difficult to, to come to grips with the approval of a futures-based ETF that is priced directly based on physical Bitcoin um, when, when those markets are, are unregulated. And so I think we've seen that actually culminate just yesterday or the day before um, Grayscale, which is the largest digital asset manager in the world, uh, you know, filed a letter with the SEC basically saying that if their, if their ETF gets denied, their physical backed ETF gets denied, they have plans to, you know, take legal action. And the, the reasons that they cited, there were a variety of them, but first and foremost was if one of the main reasons that the SEC has cited for not approving a physically backed ETF was the lack of a uh, regulated market of substantial size. Right. It's been very unclear what that size is, but the, the, SEC, uh, the CFTC uh, CME Bitcoin futures um, are a substantial size. It's just potentially not enough to meet that requirement of the SEC. And so it's, it's a little confusing to approve a futures-based ETF yeah. when then you're citing that as a reason uh, uh, that, that it's not a significant size. Uh, yeah, and I, I, th I think Gary also referenced this point. He, he worried about, obviously, he couldn't police the entire globe's trading of digital assets, but he could police the U.S. Uh, market. Now, CME is obviously contained within the, within the U.S., so he's saying, well, I can regulate that. I think that's a transparent, fair market, and therefore any products that reference that yep. are going to be fine. But th the reality of the matter is, is that the settlement price of the CME contract is actually derived by th spot exchanges, which, of course, are a function of global volumes. Right. Um, so, so that's the problem. That's the, that, that's the, that's the thing that we're grappling with. Uh, Ophelia, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I, th I think part of the issue you're running into here is that Fundamentally, futures-based products are made for a different group of people. Right. And I think that's something that we, the ETF industry is not always transparent to people outside of it. Like, unless you happen to be dealing with these products, you might, you might not be aware, right? It, it, the issues with these futures roles is not dissimilar from what you would see in a leveraged ETF. And those exist, and, and they have a market for them, and they're typically used by people who are actively trading. And, yeah. and that's short who they're made short for. Short-term traders. Absolutely. Yep. And so there's there's a reason for these products to exist. And I think there's been a narrative that like there's no logic for this at all. And, and there absolutely is. There's a group of people for whom this is a perfectly appropriate product. They should absolutely be in it. They should absolutely buy it. It does what they're looking for, where they want that exposure to those futures for whatever reason that is, and they're looking to you know, either trade short-term volatility and, and they're running a specific strategy. And there are people for whom that is a great thing. Um, it's one of the reasons why if you look at the size of those products and how they've grown, you're starting to see what the actual market size for those types of issues, those types of products are. And it's consistent with what you would expect of like a gold futures product versus gold or any other market where you have that type of instrument. And most commodities markets do. You mm. also have futures backed products and they, they do have a market. And I think it's super important to highlight that these products do have a reason to exist. However, I agree with you completely. They're really not meant for everybody and they're not one size fits all and they are expensive. And so they're, you need to be looking for that exposure in a very specific way if that's what you're going for. Right. And we both obviously built spot products. So we <laughs> have a yeah. house view on this, but I think it's just a different, it's a fundamentally different market. And I think that's a really important thing to remember when we talk about these products because it's absolutely true. They, they do reference spot. They, they are exposed to fluctuations in the underlying. And fundamentally, they target a different group of people. So when you think about like whether we're actually meeting the brief in the U.S. of providing that exposure in a regulated wrapper, the answer right now is no. Yeah. We're providing something different, right. and that different doesn't necessarily mean shouldn't isn't a thing or shouldn't be a thing or is a you know is wrong for everybody but it's it's not necessarily the most 
appropriate product to fit sort of the box I think a lot of people hoped it would. It's yeah. really for a different use case. Yeah, no, th thank you. Yeah, I think one thing last to add, I, I think on the road to that physically backed ETF um, that is for that long-term holder, to Ophelia's point, right? There's not really that perfect vehicle in no. the US today. No. You've had closed-end OTC traded products that traded premiums and discounts. You now have a futures-based product. So in light of the investor protections, I think sometimes it gets missed a little bit that um, having a regulated product, like we've seen in other jurisdictions in Europe and in Canada and others, that is a real value add and does add a lot of investor protections, yeah. right? right? And so I think this letter that was submitted is a, is a big step on the road to that happening. Similar to what happened in Canada, many people don't know the story, but 3IQ actually went through a very, very similar process back in 2019 filing for the first exchange traded Bitcoin product, which was denied and that process that ruling had to be challenged in order to a fairly strongly worded letter wasn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and and that had to be challenged in order to to win that battle and get the product approved so i think whether or not um, they win and the product gets approved the, this process will provide some clarity yeah. as to what the indi what the the metrics and thresholds need to be yeah. in order for the SEC to get comfortable approving which I don't I think agree. we've had that transparency up until now and also hopefully put some of the requirements the SEC has set up in context because right now we're applying standards like an undefined standard that I I would question whether you know gold, when that was issued, or bronze, or platinum, or any of the precious metals, when those products started coming to market. I, I don't know that, that if you look at the history of trading in similarly structured global markets based on commodity style, yeah. style products, we haven't needed to meet those same levels of right. requirements. So what are, those, what are those requirements? And what I does think that actually that mean? This process will help shed light on what those are, because the standards are absolutely different here. Yeah, I, and look, if people want to protect the investors, but if investors really want exposure to something, they'll get it. And so it might push them out in, further out into the risk spectrum, which is obviously not what the regulators want. Their primary mandate is to protect investors. I'm gonna have to move on to the, to the next point. And actually, it's, it, we're gonna only briefly discuss DeFi. Um, Gary did mention DeFi, and he said that there are centralized elements of DeFi, which was a little murky to me, uh, but really, um, in a truly decentralized system, how does a regulator even take hold of something like that? How do you how do, you do that? Um, where, where, Ophelia, do you want to do you want to take that? <laughs> I think the honest answer is you don't. Yeah, there's not a good way on, to do you? that. And it, it, there's a to go back to what we were just talking about. There is a history of decentralized trading. It did in fact exist. It has existed historically. This isn't new. Right. The, the concept of like a global commodities market is probably the closest thing. Um, equities and, and fixed income trade a little bit differently, but there are global markets for things like gold and copper and platinum. There are points of centralization, so the, the, the London gold fix being one of them, but typically those actually cause problems. Like right. think about the problems that occurred around trading manipulation with the gold fix. It was only like a few years ago. Yeah. Um, that's an issue. Like when, when you're getting to Points of centralization in decentralized systems end up, in my opinion, causing more harm than good in terms of actually achieving the outcomes of investor protections and transparency and ultimately regulation. Mm. I don't think centralization and regulation have to be the same things. I, I agree with you. I think you can make it so that if someone is doing something wrong, you know, you can pull them over and give them a ticket as opposed to trying to be in a situation where we're fighting against a trend. It's like trying to swim the wrong way up a river. Like it, that's gonna be increasingly difficult and in a world that is, from a trade perspective, from a markets perspective, increasingly globalized and therefore by extension decentralized, I right. think that may in fact just be a losing battle. Yeah, uh, I do ag agree, uh, but I think one space that has a you know, better chance of being regulated is the point of entry and exit. Um, if you can't effectively enforce regulation at the market structure level, which is super high in a, de in a, in a decentralized way, uh, you've at least got a, a shouting chance of, um, a fighting chance of regulating from an AML point of view. This has very much been the focus of the FCA, of FINMA, uh, and of course of the, the Mika regulation coming out. Uh, it is, you know, if, if we can't control uh, what happens once it's inside the system, 
um, at least let's make sure that the entry and exit points uh, are validated. Mm -hmm. and, and that's actually key to you know, BCB's um, constant uh, you know, keeping on the right side of the regulators is how do we, um, you know, how do we strike that right balance? Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we make sure that that's, uh, you know, nothing slips through the net? That, that's the fight here. Regulating the fiat on ramps, I think, seems to be the trend where crypto is going, right? The, the place where you take cash from your salary that's been paid into your bank account and get it into the crypto world seems to be the most likely point where we can actually do things like that, the payments rails. I'm going to have to m move on. I'd like to stay with you, Oliver, actually. Uh, one of the, we talk about these payment rails. Um, for four and, a, four and a half, five years, the banking problem has been a real problem. Uh, getting any kind of crypto-focused business uh, banked by a traditional banking provider has been a no-go. You've obviously evolved to meet that need. Um, can you dis discuss a little bit of how BCB sets up and sort of how you've circumvented the problems, or sort of solved the problems, I should say? I think the problems are around, the, uh, again, AML. So priority number one for us is extremely rigorous monitoring on the on the payments, both fiat and, and crypto. Nothing that comes in and out, uh, it, you know, escapes scrutiny, uh, and everything is extremely well qualified. So uh, just to, for those who are less familiar with us, we're, we're a B two B company, but many of our clients are B two C. So these are large crypto on and off firms like Crypto. dot com, uh, you know, uh, Bitstamp, etc. One of the co sponsors here. And um, for us, like, so the reason that large institutions haven't been able to lean in effectively at the transaction level is, uh, you know, historically has been not, not understanding the risks. Um, now the risks are better understood, but it's about how, you know, effective means of managing and mitigating those risks. Um, so, uh, I mean, the, the, the super short answer is, you know, for the $50 billion or so that have passed through our pipes in the last year or so, um, it is just about being on the front foot, uh, uh, um, you know, at the expense of good business. We've had some pretty juicy um, crypto clients who we've had to, and I can't name names, but, we, you know, we've had to either unbank or turn away business, um, super high margin business, just because we don't have the comfort that they're applying the level of controls that, that you know, that count for us. Yeah. Long story short, uh, AML, transaction monitoring, um, that's, um, you know, that's where the investment needs to happen. If we're going to see this entire analog world money transition effectively to uh, the digital future. Perfect. I mean, so obviously the three panelists are doing a great job in bridge bridging crypto and traditional finance. We obviously have the banking rail solution and we have the investment products that bring digital assets to a wide market. Um, I'd like to just spend the next five minutes and then hopefully get a couple of audience questions. Um, I'm getting a smile, so I'm taking that as a yes. Um, just looking forward, uh, what's next from your company, you know, companies? Uh, how are you going to, what's the future need that you're going to be meeting? So Chris, um, you've got a few things in the pipeline. Could you talk about that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So as we're talking about ETFs and other products, right, at 3IQ, and I think a lot of the asset managers in the space are now looking at how do we build products that are differentiated and, and add a lot of value to investors. And so, especially in light of there not being an ETF available in the US, you know, what is the second fastest growing investment vehicle in, in the States? And, and those are actually SMAs, separately managed accounts. And so one thing that we're spending a lot of time on is We've been working with other partners like Gemini to develop uh, a separately managed account platform. Uh, essentially, a sep separately managed account in, in uh, the simplest terms is an account owned by the investor, managed by investment professionals. And so this is a way that provides a lot more flexibility customiz and customizability around getting access to this asset class. It's typically more for uh, high net worth individuals and institutional investors that want that more flexibility than an ETF necessarily provides. You can invest in uh, strategies that range from Bitcoin to index products to a variety of other strategies in there. Um, and you can do certain things like tax loss harvesting, like staking, like lending, participating in the ecosystem through a vehicle like that, right. that you can't necessarily do in you know, an omnibus ETF vehicle. So these are the types of value add um, services that we're looking to bring um, to, to the market in the US and even just more globally. Um, and you know, I think that's the goal of a lot of asset managers, even on this panel, is to, to get more accessibility Correct. into this space through vehicles that are 
adding value for investors. That's brilliant. It's so exciting. And, and Ophelia, you, you've blazed the trail this year of products that come out and kept us as crypto compare pretty busy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, we, we've we now rounded out our product suite. We're running 20 different products, including index products, a bunch of single asset trackers. We're running products at stake on your behalf. We're doing all sorts of different things in that space. I think for our company, you can expect that to expand, um, both in terms of the footprint of the products we cover, as well as the geographies that we do it in. Um, the where I spend most of my time is actually at the infrastructure layer. So I, some people in this room may know this, but ETFs are incredibly inefficient things to run. <laughs> um, they are expensive to launch. They're difficult to maintain. It's a lot of people, mostly sharing spreadsheets is how the legacy infrastructure works. Like, oh, don't say that. Uh, no, that, that, is, that is how a lot of ETFs are still run today. So one of the big focuses for us is really um, building out more automated, uh, more scalable ETF infrastructure so that hopefully we can start to drop some of those barriers to entry, obviously in the crypto space, but also beyond. Thank you. And uh, Oliver, what's next for you in 2022? Uh, the big one for us is BCB yield accounts. Um, so this is a, as short as possible. Um, the space that we operate in has uh, negative interest rates in euro and Swiss francs. Uh, so for the 200 or so businesses that we have on the books, and cumulatively across those accounts, there's roughly half a billion euros and, and Swiss francs and a, a bit of a Japanese yen. These are all earning negative rates. So uh, that's the one half of the equation. The other half of the equation is that we're seeing some um, really smart ways of generating yield on uh, stable coins like USDC. And, um, uh, and we have natively excellent FX capability. So we're bringing the two together. We've got the depth of market in USDC, high yield accounts. We've got a huge demand in Euro, Swiss francs, and Japanese yen and other currencies uh, through FX swaps and um, regulated instruments, um, uh, uh, securities funds through Luxembourg. We can bring those 5 to 10% returns to, uh, to that cash, which is just, uh, yeah. So BCB yield accounts, we're super excited to launch that. Um, Chris Arulio is in the room somewhere here if you want to. He's the product manager of that. Thank you. That's great. I have managed to get through the questions, so I'd love to ask the audience maybe if there's uh, one, or, one or two questions that we have. Uh, not all at once, though. Uh, Stephen, uh, if we can get you a quick mic. Yep. Good morning, and congrats to Saldus and Crypto Compare for this amazing conference. Um, I just want to say hi to all my friends on, on the, the dais. And Olivia, you said something regarding futures-based um, ETFs, which I just want to take issue with, fully recognizing that physical-based ETF is a superior vehicle. So I'm not arguing with that. But I think to make the analogy between a futures-based ETF, and there are now three in the marketplace, as being somehow analogous to leveraged or inverse, I don't think that's correct. They're not leveraged. There may be tracking error, but there's plenty of ETFs with tracking error. And I think the simple fact that over a billion has been raised very quickly means the demand is across the spectrum. We all hope that there will be physical ETFs in the US. You're working on one. I'm sure our friends at 3IQ are as well. But I don't think investors should think of them in, this, in, the, in the bucket of heavily warning labeled uh, leveraged and inverse ETFs. So it's a question statement, which you're more than welcome to respond to. Sure. So what, what I meant by that, and I, I completely agree with you, these are not the same thing as leverage ETFs, not even close. But where the, the similarity I was trying to draw, and, and maybe it wasn't super clear, but the similarity I was trying to draw is that fundamentally the futures products, in the same way that you can have products like that, they're really designed to provide a specific type of exposure that's typically based, and if you look at the profile of who futures products are going to be like most well suited for your ideal person who's getting bang on exactly the best thing they can possibly get. There's a group of people that are doing trading that are more interested in like short to medium term holding for whom the futures products are actually the best possible products. They're not a consolation prize for physical. And I think it's super important to cons to remember that there is actually a group of people for whom this is exactly what they want, exactly what they need, and exactly how they want to trade it. And in my, the analogy I was making to the inverse and leverage is that in a similar way that those products are not necessarily broadly applicable to you want 2x levered exposure to Apple, 
a packaged ETF may or may not be the best way for you to get that exposure. There's a group of people for whom it is amazing, but it's not necessarily everybody. And I think it's important to, and the point I was trying to make, and I think I agree with you, the futures products sometimes get a bad rap because right now they're being used as a substitute for something else. And they have a place, they have a place, they have product market fit, they have people who need that product. Mm. It's just not everybody and it doesn't meet the full need in a similar way to those leverage and inverse products absolutely meet the needs of a specific group of people but are not necessarily the one size fits all for how you may want to achieve leverage to a market because of that holding period question. So I think that's what I was trying to say as a point, not so much the, the risk profile but more that concept of a product built for a specific subsegment of a market. And I think just to back that up with data, if you, like you mentioned before, if you look at the actual AUM of, of what's been raised by these products, it's relatively small to the AUM potential of a you know, physically backed ETF for long-term investors. If you just look at you know, the markets in Europe and the size of those products, the size of the products in, in Canada, generally the US has multiples more AUM uh, just because of the size of the capital markets here, you know, first Canada, it might be 10x the size typically for other investment products. Canada's crypto physical, physical ETF market is around 6 billion. So you'd expect in the US that would be 50 billion plus probably in these types of vehicles. And we've seen much, much smaller demand. So I think that I think that speaks to kind of what those products are being used for. There was analysis from I think it was Bloomberg on this, actually comparing that and trying to do market sizing. And from what we're seeing so far in the market, like seems pretty consistent in that, you know, what is it like? I think the, the estimate from Bloomberg is like four to six billion of demand for a futures based product. And that seems about right. At least directionally yeah. where we're at with the futures products right now. Thank kind of makes sense. I'm going to have to uh, end this now, but it's been a fascinating debate. I'm sure you can all agree. Um, I want to thank my panelists, Chris Matter, president of 3IQ, Ophelia Snyder, president of 21 Shares, and Oliver van Landsberg, Saidi, CEO of BCB Group. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.